Welcome to episode 56 of Kowalski Analysis. How is everyone doing? If you're uh, watching live, drop a hello or a hey or a hi in the comments. Let me know that you're here. Let me know that you can see me and hear me coming through. Okay. If you're listening to this uh, recording, of the hello also to you. Not sure if you're able to leave me a comment, depending on what platform you're on, but if you could share this out, it would be greatly appreciated. And if you're listening to it on a podcast platform, subscribe and leave me a five-star review. Point with a new intro. I need to make a podcast intro. And I was thinking about what do I want to say? What, who is this podcast for? And, and what is it about? And I don't think it's only for singles, but I I'm toying with the following. Let me know what you think. Welcome to the Kowalski Analysis, a podcast designed to help you navigate the weight, become the best version of yourself and become the person you're looking for is looking for. What do you think of that? You like it? Let me know in the comments below if, if you think that's good. But I'm really excited tonight. We have an amazing guest, somebody that I, I can't wait to talk to. Actually, I see a lot of similarities in my story and his story. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to talk to him. His name is Joshua Broom. I'll tell you who he is in a second. But before we get into it, let me go ahead and, and mention my sponsor. Let me just go share my screen with you now. And that is Mr. Micah Hughes. Micah has been my sponsor now for over a year. And I was just reflecting on him and how grateful I am. It's because of him that I can put time into this, talking to people with these amazing stories. And hopefully somebody out there is being inspired. Someone's life is being changed. And I know that I do get messages from people somewhat regularly. Yeah. So thank you, Micah. And if you guys are in the market to buy a home, sell a home, or you want to get into real estate investing, please give Micah a call. Let him know I sent you 443-532-8450. And I'll put his email address in the comments. So let's get to it with Joshua. So let me tell you who Joshua is. Joshua Broom grew up in a small town in South Carolina where he started modeling. And then eventually he dropped out of college and moved to LA to pursue a career in acting. He, had in, he inadvertently found his way into the porn industry and spent five years there making over 1000 films, winning several awards and traveling around the, the world. Yet he was suicidal. Joshua left the porn industry and is now a pastor a passionate anti-porn advocate, a husband and a father to three children. And he wants people to know the depth of God's mercy and kindness. Let's bring him into the podcast now. Hey, sir. How are you? Hey, Joshua. What's up, brother? How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Really good. Really good. Cool, man. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Really excited to talk to you. Where are you at? South Carolina? No. Iowa. You living there? What's that? Are you living in Iowa? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in South Carolina, but I haven't lived in South Carolina since I was 18. Okay. Uh, oh, I was 20, 21. Yeah, 21. Okay. So when you moved back home, actually, I don't want to spoil any, spoil the story. So yeah. you can tell me about all that. Yeah. But, uh, I'm super pumped to talk to you, man. I've, I've been you know, re reading up, watching a bunch of your interviews, preparing for this and see a lot of similarities in our stories. So excited to dive in with you. Yeah. How's the audio? Sounds pretty good on my end. How's it sound on my... Oh, wait. Hold on a second. I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. Yeah. I got the right mic in. Does it sound okay? Yeah, it sounds great. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I always tell people, if, again, if you're out there, you're watching this, drop a, a hi or hello in the comments if, we're seeing, if you're seeing us and hearing us okay for coming through. Just let us know. But yeah, man. So let's just get started. Yeah. I, I saw that your mom got pregnant with you at the age of 16. I don't know if you know anything about my story, but my mom got pregnant with me. At, well, your mom had you at the age of 16. I don't know if she was pregnant at 16. She might've been pregnant at 15. My mom was pregnant with me at 14. And right. uh, we, so your dad wasn't pretty much in the picture while you were growing up? Is, is that what I had read? You had a stepfather that was- Somewhat. So my mom had me when she was 16 and we were living at my- we were living at my my grandmother's, right? So my mom was still living at home. So we I grew up with my mom and my grandparents, my mom's sister and her two brothers. And we lived there until I was seven. And then my mom got married. But my dad, so he lived in the town that I grew up in. And it wasn't like, so I knew who he was, but the town was so small that I would actually see him like in the grocery store. From my, my experience, he just chose not to be like, a father, right. but as a 16 year old in, in, in retrospect, we, we have de we have squashed the whatever, like any kind of like feelings that I would have had, yeah. but as a 16 year old, gosh, what do you do? And it was, it was just one of those deals where it was really difficult for me because I saw him, yeah. but was it like 
dad to me. I, I didn't have a relationship with him. I've probably had 20 interactions with him in my entire life. And probably 15 of those have been in the last five years. Wow. Was your mom a believer? So I think she was where I was. So my grandparents, particularly my grandma, my grandmother was like fire and brimstone. She, if she was, you know, bleeding and dying, like she was still in church, loved Jesus, loved Billy Graham, loved listening to gospel music, like really bad gospel music with like guys with gigantic mustaches, just like, like all the time. But so my mom knew a lot about God and I think for her, a little bit of a spoiler, but like late, later on in life, as I was walking through how to unpack Romans Road in an even more simplistic way, we were just having a conversation and I think like something like really clicked. I don't know if that was the moment that she gave her life to Christ, but I think that was the moment that she saw that God was someone that wanted to have a personal relationship with her. And that changed the way that she saw herself because she understood who she was in his eyes and how much he loved her. And then, so like, we have this like aha moment and we cry and we pray. And the church that I was pastoring at that point, um, we were having baptism in two weeks, but I was like, she's not going to be here. So we went out in my backyard and the, our entire, and our entire staff came and I baptized my mom in the pool All behind right. my, that was about two years ago. That's awesome, dude. My, so my uh, very similar stories, like my grandmother took, uh, care of me. She had custody of me till I was like four or five because my mom was so young. She moved out of the house. My, gran my grandmother was a strong Christian. She took me to Alana's as a little kid, Sunday school, big bow ties. And yeah. then my mom got custody of me when I was like four or four or five. She had gotten remarried, but she wasn't really there spiritually. Like she's a, a professing Christian, but it's still a little, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you had mentioned with your mom, like that the God wants to help you make decisions in life. Oh, yeah. we're like not just pray before yeah. you eat kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was like, it was never reinforced at home and then not having to, I, cause I try to reverse engineer my own life. Cause I was a stripper. I was like the big stripper in Baltimore for several years. And I'm like, at the age of 15, I wanted to be a stripper. I remember seeing a videotape of strippers and I was like, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah. Like, that's not normal. Like, where did that come from? And I'm like, maybe it was not having the strong male role model. I think it was some insecurity of wanting to be popular, wanting the validation of being like, feel like I was a man being good with girls yeah. kind of thing. And I was just wondering how much do you think that played into you making those decisions? Do you think it was yeah. from yeah. that, that around? From like, from a like psychological standpoint, when it comes to what are my strengths, I'm like in the 99th percentile, an achiever, right? So like, I feel affirmed and I feel like purposeful when I achieve something like a sticky note is my best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Like I get fired up. I get fired up when it's like something so simplistic. It's, I took out the trash, whatever. <laughs> Same. Not to that extent, but for me, so that being my personality type and pairing that with seeing this person that ch like made the conscious decision not to be my dad. While I can understand the decision, it didn't change the impact it had on me, how I saw myself. So right. I did feel I didn't like I, I had my grandfather in my life and he loved me and he taught me everything there was about fishing but he was never like a, a father figure so I never really had any kind of male leadership this is how become a man like these things are important this like when it talks about like leadership or just your place like in a marriage or dating or any of those conversations I never had them with anyone. Yeah. So it kind of like felt I needed to prove myself. And I did that way through accolades. So it's like I was very successful in basketball and I was very successful in modeling. So I started modeling when I was around 14, 15. And by achieving those things, I was affirming myself, but it was just momentary. Yeah. So it just, I had this like momentary gratification that would dissipate. And then I would feel like I needed to do something else. And if I was in a lull where I wasn't getting my fix through that achievement, I felt very down on myself. Mm. Wow. Yeah, no, I can totally relate to that, man. Like I was thinking about when I gave my life to, to the Lord, I went from being super popular and making what I thought was a lot of money, having a lot of sex with women. And, and then 
being made aware that Jesus was real, you know, he was who he said he was and having that relationship. I remember thinking like, man, I could do any, I could just work like at a grocery store. Actually, I saw that you worked at a grocery store. I remember thinking like, I could just work at a grocery store. It doesn't matter. And nothing matters because you can't put a, like nothing is worth not having peace with God and yourself, you know? Yeah. And I think like that is the most important aspect of my story where it's, that's why I tell my story with such vulnerability and transparency, because it's, it's not like I dabbled in the porn industry. I was, I oh, won boy. former of the year. I, I was nominated for performer of the year three times. I did over a thousand movies. I accrued like over a million dollars in wealth. I traveled the world. I did all these things. And I say that to say, at the end of the day, after having all those things that I believe so matter of fact that I would be happy, that would be it. I felt miserable. I felt so miserable that I didn't even see life worth living. And, and that's why I tell my story with such transparency, because, man, there's so many people that's like, if I had this, I would be happy. If I accomplished this, if I had the house, the car, the money, and it's, man, I had it. And yeah left me feeling so empty because gosh, there's just imagine the feeling of here's the thing you thought you needed in life. And it left you feeling not like you thought it would. Gotta be so lonely. I think about people like Tom Cruise, man. I'm like, that guy climbed it. He climbed yeah. to the top of the ladder and he looks around. He's, this is it. This is all there. Yeah. And then it's gotta be so depressing because there's no, there's nothing left to climb. If yeah. you don't know God, then that's got to be like super hopeless. Yeah, I mean, that that's the most simplistic truth that I want to share with people. It's like peace apart from Jesus doesn't exist. Not only is it not attainable, it doesn't exist. There's a peace in you. It's a void in you and God gives you skepticism to ask questions and search and experience life and to fail and to win and to do all these things. But at the end of the day, he's trying to lead you to himself and he Absolutely. makes himself absolutely it's, it's very easy to see that god exists but it's really easy to deny him at the same time if yeah. you stand in your own way yeah i think that's why he says it's better to be hot or cold because than lukewarm because at least when you're cold like you were ice cold i was ice cold when you're cold you hit bottom you have yeah. to. when you're lukewarm you might never hit bottom you just teeter along the bottom yeah. and so you you wonder you're like i think i'd be happier if i had more money or if i made had more sex or whatever but people like you and I know we went all the way down the end of the road. I'm telling you, it doesn't go on. You're not going to go as far as I went. I'm telling you, it's a dead end. Yeah. So, yeah. But I yeah. think that's why Jesus said, I'd, I'd rather you be hot or cold than, than lukewarm, because at least if you're cold, you're going to hit bottom and you're going to turn to him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that is the enemy's greatest weapon is someone who is neutral. Hey, Rob Kowalski here. When I first got serious about living intentionally and becoming a better version of myself, I found a major shortage of things to do and people to do them with. And it was the loneliness and boredom that led me to starting CityFam. So I just wanna take a moment right now and encourage you to go over and join the CityFam Facebook community. It's a free Facebook group and in it you'll find purpose-driven people from all over the world that wanna enjoy life to the fullest. You can search it on Facebook or you can go to www.friendswithbetterbenefits.com and it'll take you right there. While I'm mentioning it, if you're single, searching for real love, love before sex, as I like to say, I wanna encourage you to join the Waiting Works community. That's another free Facebook group I put together designed to help people wait well, date well, and ultimately hit the mark in life and love. And you can go to www.reallovewaits.com and I'll see you over there. Now back to the episode. Now, are you a senior pastor now? Yeah, so I was, so I was a pastor at Life Church in Oklahoma. So it's just, just the radical transformation and opportunities that God has provided me. Like his provision for me is just absolutely blowed my mind. But I go from being in the industry to, I give my life to Christ. The next week I walk into, how do you want to unpack this? Does it matter? Or just pretty extroverted. And, and as I, I don't even know what I'm saying until it comes out of my mouth a lot of times. So, I'm just going to know, I'm just going to let you know that's what you're going to get unless you steer me in a direction. That's all good. Just respect. Okay. So I give my life to Christ. A week goes by. I walk into my, I walk into the executive pastor's office of the church I was at. It was a very large church, one of the bigger churches in Raleigh, North Carolina and five location church. And I'm like, Hey, is there a pastor I can talk to? They're like, sure. Actually the executive pastor is available. If you just have a quick question. And I was like, Hey man, my name is Joshua, and I feel like God is calling me to build a boat. And he was like, what? <laughs> God is calling me to do something that is bigger than I can comprehend, 
And my grandfather taught me, if you want to do something, whatever it is, learn to do it well first. And what I want to do is share my story. And I know if I want to share my story, I need to understand how to read the Bible and how to teach it to other people. He's, I love it. I love it. What's so neat is there was a pastor. His name is Andrew Yates. Um, he was, there was a pastor that had just moved to Raleigh and they were launching their fifth location and it wasn't open yet. So he had some spare time and he was like, hey man, if you want, we can meet a few times a week or whatever you want to do. And let, let's just, I'll teach you, you know, how to read the Bible. You will talk about observation, interpretation, application. We'll just start there and we'll go from there. And he didn't really know what he was getting into because at that time I, I owned a gym. So I changed my schedule where I can meet with him almost every day for three or four hours a day. So it was almost like, I, Hey, like I want this bad and just, right. that's just who I am. Like whatever I'm doing, I'm yeah. all in. Same. And yeah. For good or for bad. Right. For right. Good or bad, that's just who I am. Like whatever I'm doing, I'm all in. I'm a maniac. I was like, okay, if whatever free time I want to spend it like growing. And he taught me how to read the Bible and he taught me how to teach people how to read the Bible. And then we spent a year like going through Greek and it's like, I can read Greek and I can go through the New Testament. And like we, he got to the point where I can like read and articulate like the book of John. And then it's like, okay, it's like you value education. I respect you. And I, I just know that's how you worship in some capacity. So I went back to school and I you know, enrolled in Liberty University and you know pursued a degree in Christian ministries. And now I'm, I want to get my master's and just this process continues going but like in the middle of that process like while i'm still in school it's i'm really i feel called to step out and pastor i'm getting these opportunities and i'm you know so someone said hey do you want to share your story at this church and i was like sure and it went really well and then i had another opportunity and that another opportunity and that was five years ago and that led to me saying man i think i'm going to apply for a church and it's like me like big vision big dreams so, so i'm like I'm going to apply to Live Church. They have 35 locations, and Craig Rochelle's the, the pastor. Why I'm not? To, I'm going to GLS. Yeah. Oh, that's sick. That's yeah. sick, man. But I was just like, yeah. So I, I applied and I got a call back, you know, from my application because the application was like, you had an option to make a video. And I'm like, I'm just going to like share my passion for what I want to do. And I did that and I got another interview and another interview. And I was like, man, I think I'm going to, I know I'm going to get this job. I, I went from, I think, and I told my wife, I'm like, I'm going to get this job. And we just bought a house a year ago. I was like, we have to sell our house. And then she could have been so many times. She's the best, but so many times she could have been like, okay, that's pretty out there. Let's reel it in. Let's wait for things to happen. Let's be a little more safe. We, you know, she was eight months pregnant at the time. And I was like, I, I'm going to get this job we have to sell this house. And I'm like, she was like, okay, you know, I, I trust you. And I put the house, we put the house on the market and it sells for $20,000 over what we were asking for it in 12 hours. Wow. So, and, and we accept the offer. So we accept the offer and I have yet to go to the last interview. And I show up to the last interview and I'm like, Hey, this is my wife. God has already spoken this job into existence. And pretty much I'm here as a formality. Like I, I trust that God is going to do in and through my life um, so much. And this is part of the process. And I got the job. So at that point, I owned a gym and that gym, I just like at that point, so much had happened in my life that people would have given me opportunity after opportunity where I didn't really deserve it. And I had people in my life that I was pouring into and that I was extending trust. And there was a guy who ultimately was running the gym i built him up and he was a great leader and i trusted him and he provided me the margin to do ministry and on the gym and do both things at a very high level because mm -hmm. i really believe like excellence honors god so whatever you're going to do like it's important to do it well and i was just like man i'm going to give you this gym so i met with him we had coffee and i was like hey um, I don't want you to take over the gym. I want you to have it. So I signed it away with us still owing a decent chunk of money, you know, on equipment and stuff like that for, through a business loan. But, you know, I was like, I just want to give you this. So that happened in July. I accept a position at Life Church. I'm working there as a pastor. And then December rolls around and we were, we were fine, but like money was like 
getting a little bit tight, but like we were fine. And I get something in the mail and I was like, this kind of looks like a return check. And I was like, I hope we didn't bounce a check, but my wife is the most organized, systematic person that I've ever met. So there was no chance of that happening, but I was just like, this is what it looks like. And I open it and someone had went into the bank and paid with a cashier's check, paid off our loan. To this day, I still don't know who did it. Wait, wait, for the what? The house or where? Oh, for our business loan. So we still owe $20,000 on like equipment on from the, the gym. gym. Right. Gotcha. And someone, and someone paid it off mm. in full. Wow. And so it's, man, like th this is crazy. And then COVID happens and we have another kid and a lot of stuff's going on in my life. And I've been sitting on this book and I, I started having the opportunity to like travel and share my story and just like so much stuff was going on. And it just made sense where like, man, being at Life Church equipped me to do ministry at a very high level. Because like when it comes to utilizing systems and structure and like delegating and taking what God gives you and making the most out of it from an organizational standpoint, really well, like, holy moly, I learned so much in that year. But I was like, man, I, I think I'm ready to, I don't know what it's going to look like, but my wife and I decided to move to Iowa where she's originally from mm. and just like that be our home base and start a ministry. And that's where we are today. Yeah. Craig Grishel, wasn't he like a business guy, like a business major or something before he got into yeah. the <laughs> He's, he has always been a, a business guy. So he, like he was selling real estate when he was in college. So he's got his hands in all kinds of things, but from the jump, like he was, he was a Methodist pastor 20 years ago mm -hmm. and he, he started meeting in his basement and it has grown to Thanks. what life and what the, the U, U version Bible app is now. Right. Um, and it's all because of his yes, in spite of what, this is going to be hard, but I'm going to move towards what God is calling me to do anyway. Rashawn Copeland. Rashawn, I got to introduce him. He, he's worked with Craig too. He's I'm so blessed daily. He's got that and he's got a podcast, but I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. I'm going to make yeah, him. Yeah, I, I definitely his name sounds familiar, but it, it doesn't. I don't think I, I know him personally. It's like asking somebody that works at Amazon if they know somebody else. I'm sure <laughs> like right. yeah. so freaking big. Okay. So you're, are you actually part of a congregation there? Like a denomination in, in Iowa? Yeah, so our, our church is called Known, so Known Church, and we're right outside of Iowa City. Nice. Is it affiliated with any denomination, ARC, or? It's, it's so we plan it through SEND. Okay, cool. I don't know, but I'm just curious. So yeah, let, so yeah, go so ahead. We're, we are non-denominational. I'm not attached to SBC or ARC or anything like that, but, right. but I do have people who are, thank God, providing me with checks and balances. Yeah, we all need that. So let me... Like do, after you met Jesus, how hard was it to quit? Was it the sex a hard thing to conquer? I know for me, it was super difficult. Like after going from, I was probably a sex addict. Yeah. So for me, so I left the industry and then there was a huge lull. There was a huge gap between me leaving the industry and me giving my life to Jesus. There was a huge gap. Yeah. So for me, like I was so broken, like sex wasn't even like, really the issue the issue for me was like the, the mental and emotional like trauma that i had been through because like when i left the industry so pretty much the last eight months of my time in the industry so i win performer of the year huge deal i've been nominated for it three times and just if you win that award it's like the industry is like at your disposal like as a guy because already as a, a successful guy in the industry they only use consistently about 20 25 guys because is he's taking on all the risk so a director is paying for the talent he's paying for the location he's paying for the the crew editing r renting the property paying for the lease to do the film the permits all that stuff so the director is taking on all those costs so all the risk is on him and the guy is the only person that doesn't the guy is the only person that is not guaranteed to get paid or he's the guy that could screw everything up because if right. he can't, yeah. he can't in the rest yeah. So, yeah if the guy doesn't do his job there's no product Right. Absolutely. But at the same time, everyone else has done their job. So everyone else is going to get paid. So there, so the director is going to hire someone they trust because like their trust is in that you are able to do the job because if you're not, I just wasted $20,000. So with that said, there would be, so that you can pretty much ask for whatever you would want. It's like, as far as like from a financial standpoint. So it was a big deal that I won that in won the award, but when I won the award, 
they call my name to come on stage, call my name again, call my name again. I'm not there. I'm actually at home crying my eyes out, asking the God that I didn't know if I could die. Wow. So like when I was at like what people would perceive to be the pinnacle of my career, that's when I was at my lowest. Wow. Or, oh, you must have just left the industry because you couldn't get work. I was like, I was the guy. Mm-hmm. And I left because it had destroyed my life. Like right. I had created this plausible reality around me being able to sell myself for sex. And I continued living my life. That was who I was. And I isolated myself from family and friends because I felt ashamed. And I felt like my life didn't have any value or purpose. And like, how could I be a good son? How could I be a friend? How could I be a brother? How could I be a big brother? Like, I remember going to his graduation. So my brother is a genetics professor. And I remember one of his 15 graduations. And he, his friends, like people at the graduation, like recognized me. And I remember just how humiliating that was. Because I was there, my little brother had achieved something that he had been working. But at this point, he got his PhD from Clemson. And that's where he's a professor now. But he he had achieved that. And then people were like, oh, you're that guy. You're that guy. And it was like, man, that's not why I'm here. It just felt like really like humiliating. And that was like one of the last times I, I talked to my family for quite some time because I just couldn't deal with the fact that that's who I was and that's how people saw me. Yeah. I, and, and that was what was the major catalyst for the depression, because I was already dealing with the fact that you don't do something like that and not feel some type of guilt in your subconscious. Like you don't feel good about yourself at the end of the day. You know, actually, I was listening to one of your interviews and you were talking about feeling guilty before you became a Christian. And I was like thinking in my own life, I didn't feel guilty when I was yeah. just tripping. Now I wasn't doing porn. So maybe it's a different, I'm sure it's a different level. I, I, by the end of the, I stripped for eight years, by the end of it, I was definitely like over it. I felt like I was better than it. I felt like I was like the court jester coming out to entertain. And I remember hating it, but it wasn't really guilt. I don't think. However, after I became a Christian and I actually backslid a few years, I heard you say something that I related to where you talked about looking in the mirror and not liking the person that you saw looking back. And I was definitely related to that, but that was after I became a Christian. So I found it interesting yeah. that you felt that guilt before. Do you think that was the Holy Spirit convicting you even before you knew God? Oh, absolutely. There were a multitude of times where God had provided me with don't do that. And then I did it anyway. But for me, I I think it's just a sexual encounter is supposed to be intimate. It's supposed to be in the confines of love and it's an expression of love. But the reality is when you are engaging in that, like doing those scenes, it's like the reality is there's a person that you're doing that with and they're looking and they're looking back at you and that happens and it's real. And it's not, regardless of it's, if it's 20 or 45 minutes of footage, like it, you know, it generally lasts for, you know, a lot longer than that. And, and then there's editing and directing and, and so on that makes it look like a certain product. But what happens is, man, you feel used after that. Yeah. Because nine, I would go, I would go to far say 90% of the time. It's, it's, it's not someone that you would even want to have that interaction with. And it's, it's, there's not all there's just like this amazing chemistry in between two people. Right. It's often it's someone that you get to set and you don't even talk to them. And then that happens. And then you, maybe you'll never see them again. Yeah. And it's so unnatural. It's so unnatural what happens. So like when a sexual encounter became so monotonous to me that I could, it didn't matter. Like, yeah, I, It was my job. I could do it with anyone, anything. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And that like really had an impact on me mentally and emotionally where looking someone in the eye and shaking their hands was so uncomfortable. That was so much more intimate than having sex with someone for me. (laughs) I get it, man. Yeah. I had a a lot of casual sex in my life. Probably. I don't want to get into numbers, but it was hundreds of one night stands. Yeah. To me, it was, I was numb to the act. I always wanted to do it because it became an addiction, but sex was like a massage. I used to say to me, it was like, it feels good. Do it. Why would we wait? But right. uh, knowing how I, I did feel empty afterward, especially when it happened at uh, post meeting Jesus. But I, I, I was listening to what you said in one of the uh, 
your interviews about that stuff that you would inject into your yep. penis because it was it really that difficult to get it up like with these girls so th that was when i was doing like gay porn a gay company said so for me like this was the point where i was at so i didn't want to be in the industry more i just won the award and i was like gosh i don't want to do this anymore but in the same time as like, that's this is who i am like right. there I don't have any job experience. I've only acted in model. I'm not going to play in the NBA. Like that, that's the other experience I have in life. Like I literally have nothing to offer to the world. And like in, in on top of that, there's this thousand plus like movies incriminating me from affirming that's who I am. So what am I going to do? I was like, and like, I really felt if I continued, because I was working 25, 30 times a month, like I had to say no on a daily basis so that I didn't do multiple scenes a day. Like right. that's how i was having so i was like i don't want to do this but at the same time it's i can't do anything else so how can i numb the pain how can i continue living like i'm living as far from a financial standpoint and not do that all the time and then just being a good looking guy in the industry like gay companies would I mean, offer you it's like if you ever want to do a scene we'll give you 100 grand do a scene we'll give you 100 grand we'll give you a contract six month contract we'll give you you know name your number and for me it's i i don't like i don't care anyway like it like the, the act or the person, it was so irrelevant. I think that's really hard for someone who is living like a gay lifestyle or has same-sex attraction. It's really hard for him to hear. It didn't matter to me. For me, I could do three movies a month in contrast to 30 and it have the same impact on me mentally and emotionally. And I just shoot an injection and sometimes it will work and sometimes it wouldn't, but it's, that is how I was able to do that. And for me, if I would make the same amount of money and I, I would work three times in contrast to 30, I didn't care. And I thought, okay, I could continue to do that. And I quickly found out that it was actually more detrimental to my mental and emotional health. And that's when I really felt like I was going to hurt myself. And, right. and I had that moment where it's just, I can't keep doing this. There's nothing else I can do. I might as well die. And there's 30 people in my life that was in the industry mm. the same time as me that had made, they have made that decision. They mm -hmm. did either take them, take their life or OD and take their life. Dude. 30 people. Yeah. So it's, that's where I was. So for me, it's who cares. And, and that's like the, the dark, like I would say like all the industry is dark, but gosh, like two guys are sitting there taking drugs for paraplegic people to have sex with one another. Like in with watching like straight porn in the background, cutting like every 30 seconds, just so that you can get this footage so that you can continue living your life because you don't believe that there's anything outside of it. So it's like that, that was where my life was. Yeah. I, I wasn't like a sex addict anymore because sex was never the thing that I was desiring. I was never, I never did porn because I wanted to have a lot of sex because I was already doing that. Right. Sure. Me, it was like fame, affirmation, awards, notoriety. I wanted to be an actor. So I had these opportunities to do like Star Wars and all this stuff. I had, I did all these projects and I kept lying to myself and believing it's like, this is just a way, this is just going to be who I am. This is just going to be my life. And that's just how it is. And I just have to accept that this is the best version of my life. There's nothing that's going to be outside of it. This is as good as it's going to get just enjoy it. And I would tell myself that lie that just be happy, but I never could. Yeah. But I, tried to, I tried to, I put on the mask every day and tried to be the person that was glad mm -hmm. I would always show up on time. I was responsible. I did all these things, but man, like my story, like I never got into drugs. Like sure. I would party a lot, but half the time I was being paid to be there. So it's just, I, I didn't really have this lifestyle and my story is such an anomaly when it comes to like how I got in the industry because most people they were like either manipulated or forced or they needed money or they didn't really understand that like it was a porn scene or it was like a guy who had the ability to do it and he just started dating someone and they got them in the industry but for me it's I never like saw myself man I want to do porn I didn't want to do and I was living in Hollywood and I was, I was on my way to, I don't know if, I don't know what would have happened, but I had an agent and I was working on projects and I wanted to be an actor, but I was having more success modeling. And I, I was working at like a bar slash steakhouse to supplement my income. I was doing the same thing that everyone else in Hollywood was. So that was, I was going to the gigs, I was going to auditions, I was working a job to supplement my income. And that's just, 
but it, it was going well. Like there was no reason for me to say yes to that, but someone, that agent that cause I, I met girls at that job, I met a group of girls at that job and they said, Hey, do you want to be, do you want to be an actor? And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, just let us introduce you to our agent. And they introduced me to their agent. But the thing was the agent they introduced me to was the agent in the industry. So it got plugged in and I said yes to doing it. And he told me, you can be famous, you can be rich, you can do all these things. It was just like speaking to this insecure person that had no clue who he was, real, no solidified purpose in life, no like tangible goals that I was like pursuing. It's just like, I just want, I I want to be an actor. So like when he said all these things, I was like, sure. And then I was hesitant about it and I felt guilty about it. And there was, there was a time where I was just like, I don't, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I did it and he signed me to a contract. It was like, there was never like a struggle. It was like immediate fame. Like as soon as I did one, I like like, when I started, I think I started like in the summer And I did like almost 200 movies, like in that time period before December. Wow. I was working like, I was doing like two, three movies. So just like, I went from being a guy that wanted to be an actor that was living a decent life. And I was making good money to making a lot of money and having a lot of notoriety and people saying, wow, you're that guy. Wow. You're that guy. And it just, it was this, I don't know. It was just this, I felt like I was running down a hill and I couldn't stop. Totally get it, dude. When I was in the club, so I was the biggest promoter in Baltimore too. After I stripped, I became like a promoter, took over the nightlife. And while it's going on, like I would walk through the club and I felt like a rock star because everybody, a thousand people there and everybody knows you and you're the guy that can put people on a list. And you always got a bunch of hot girls around your table, but while it's happening, it feels great. Like it's such a high, but it would always be after it'd be like Mondays. You'd have to look at yourself in the mirror when the party was over and that's yeah. The emptiness hit you didn't like the person you saw looking back but then again yeah. by, th- by thursday i'd start to forget how i felt and right. the, week- the weekend would be coming and it was really a vicious cycle for sure but i totally would have done porn before i knew jesus I'm, i was pretty depraved i heard something like it, it's not easy for a guy to get into the porn industry either it's no. almost like you have to have a girl like to kind, yeah. kind of come in with yeah. you but Be- because like i was saying sure it's easy to film yourself and put it on the internet right but like much different to like work with a company that's going to pay you a thousand dollars a day. So like those companies are not hiring Joe Smo that like saying, Hey, pick me. So it's like the reason I got in the industry and the reason I had that success, because these girls said, Hey, here's this guy. And then he, like that agent, he's okay, we'll give you a shot. And then I did, I did a movie and it went well. And that was the catalyst that, you know, yeah. So how hard was it to walk away? You see, like I heard you're the moment that you're feeling suicidal, super, super depressed. The person at the bank said, speaks to you, you really felt like it was God speaking to you. How hard was it to pull the trigger and really get off the treadmill? Cause I, I mean, I, I couldn't get off it fast enough. Really? I couldn't get, because I, I believed equivocally, like I, I believed without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to die mm-hmm. if I didn't quit. But what happened was, is I saw myself as someone that didn't have any hope, Mm -hmm. but I was seeing myself as that person that I was portraying. And what happened in that bank, when that person said my name, it shattered this plausible reality that I created for myself. And all of a sudden, I felt convicted for the first time. I felt guilty or ashamed, but I never felt convicted. Mm -hmm. Like, this is wrong. Right. You better than this but what i felt even more potently was the pain that i caused my mom and it was not because i did porn it was because i saw myself as so worthless that i didn't pick up the phone and call her like my mom went through a ton of tragedies in her life while i was going through that my mom got married finally like my mom you know got married went through an abusive, uh, a very abusive spouse for a few years, left, we struggled, we were in government housing, but like never went without anything. Just my mom would just, she would work, she would work at this restaurant, but she would work like 10, 12 hours a day and just do everything that she could. And she just found a way. And honestly, like in retrospect, I couldn't even like really appreciate that because I never went without anything. Mm. So like looking back on it and like that, 
you know, thinking about that. But then my mom, my mom finally meets someone. They get married. I wasn't there. Less than a year later, his pancreas ruptures and he dies. Damn. I wasn't there. The person that had sacrificed everything for me hmm. was hurting so bad. And all she, the thing that she needed most was me. And yeah. I wasn't. And I felt that in that moment. And just the weight was so heavy that I couldn't pick up the phone fast enough. And I was like, call my, call the agent. I quit. Call my PR guy. He put out a press release. I'm quitting. And I literally could not run fast enough. I love it. Of the three, of the following three, guilt, shame, and regret, which one did you struggle with the most? After? Shame. Shame? Yeah. That makes sense because I think that's probably, you know, typical for shame to linger after, even after forgiveness and, and, we're, and we're not supposed to feel it. But how do you teach other people like in your congregation to move past that prison of shame? Yeah. You know, from, from the worldview, from a Christian worldview, it's even though we are all sinners, right? So Romans 3.23, we, we all fall short of the glory of God. So we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we are sinners. So our neutral is if we do not actively pursue God, we will pursue sin because that's who we are. And God sees you in the middle of that and he continued to pursue you. And he loves you and he loves you so much that he was willing to sacrifice his one and only son so that you could experience life in its fullest. So Jesus did not die so that you could go to heaven. Jesus died so you could be alive. Right. Love it. So that's the difference. So it's, I need to give my life to Jesus so I, I don't go to hell. No, you need to give your life to Jesus because your life matters. There's right. a plan, purpose for your life. And God is giving you these gifts and talents and these purposes and these passions that you have that you want to pursue. But all of them are in the grand scheme of you living the life that God created you to live. Mm. And the only way that you can experience life is to understand that Jesus' death gives you access to that life mm. and God loves you so much that he provided that provision when you could never provide it. You could never earn it. Yeah. There, you could never be good enough. So it's, oh. and so just understanding that's how God sees you. And then it's man uh, there. So there's this Hebrew word. It's uh, anava, and it means uh, it's where we get our English word humility, but it really means this like God given space. And God has this space for you to step into, and you need to know him to gain access to it, and you have to have humility and courage to step in it, because it's easy to overstep it even. As a Christian, it's easy to think about, what well, my, my ministry is about me, my life is about me, I got to lead people to Jesus, and at the same time, I'm afraid to do this. I'm afraid to leave my lifestyle behind, because that lifestyle that I live it makes me feel important. It brings me comfort. But the thing is, you're just masking pain because you don't want to live that way. You just don't believe that there's a way out. And you've lied to yourself long enough that you think, man, there's not life outside of this, beyond this, and I can never replicate it. And Jesus is telling us, you're right. I have something better. Yeah. Because the life that you're living, it's not even close to the life that I want to provide you. So it's, man, there is a provision for you and there's a responsibility for you to take it because your life was purchased at a high cost. And the big thing for me, is like, that's something I talk about a lot. So John 1930, Jesus is dying. And one of the last things he says, translated from Aramaic is, it is finished. Teletest die, it, it is finished. And what he's saying is hell, death, sin, and the grave no longer have any hold on you if you are in Christ Jesus. So like, Here's what we can know. As a follower of Jesus, salvation is instantaneous. The moment you put your trust, the moment you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, like your faith is solidified. You're understanding that, hey, I'm broken. I cannot save myself. Jesus did for me what I could never could. I put my faith in. You're saved in that moment. But sanctification is a process. And what the enemy, what the devil wants to do is as you are pursuing the life that Jesus has called you to live, when you scrape your knee, because you will, because we are still 
We still have a sin nature. So you will sin. You will screw up. You will. That's guaranteed. John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. You have trials. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. So when you scrape your knee, get your butt up, dust yourself off, and keep moving. But what the enemy wants you to do is look back. It's like, oh, I got to start over. Right. Or if, if, if I did, if I watch porn, I might as well just go to a strip club tonight and I'll get, I'll get everything right on Monday. If I want to clean up a diet, if I eat a cookie at lunch, I might as well eat cake for dinner because I already screwed up my diet. And then it's Thursday, I'm, it's going to be the weekend, so I'll just eat whatever and I'll, I'll get it right on Monday. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to get off track and wants you to believe that one mistake dictates who you are yeah. and you look at yourself as a mistake and now you have to start over and you can never earn that standing because jesus already paid for it right. so just getting yourself to look at yourself how god sees you and understand how important the life that you're given like how important it is yeah. you will screw up you will scrape your knee but get up dust yourself off and keep moving yeah, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, we're supposed to do and not, not focus on the past. And I think that was <clears throat> one of the biggest motivators for me, or at least what I try to convey to people. And maybe it's because I'm, a, I'm like you, I'm a, an achiever. But the fact that God has a plan for my life, and I'm not going to hit my full potential unless I get into the center of his will. And that requires right. obedience. So for me, it's I have friends that are wasting their lives because they're living it on their own terms. And I'm like, it's like running on one cylinder, or, you know, it's, you know, a six cylinder engine. And you got some talents and some skills and you're using them for something, but it's not nearly what he would do with you if you gave it to him. And yeah. that's really the beauty of it. It is a trade because it's for me, like it's been a lot of discipline over the last 20 years, a lot of loneliness and being single, cultivating a closer relationship with him through the, uh, through not having a, a, a significant other, which has really drawn me closer to him. But when traded, man, like I know at the end of my life, I'm going to look back and not have any regret because I've right. I put it all on the table again. My, not like you said, I haven't been perfect, but I definitely, when he said jump, I jumped over and over. I've been obedient on the big things. The big yeah. Things. Yeah. And I think, I think another thing that I talk about a lot, it's obviously, so I spend a lot of my energy sharing my story and advocating against pornography and helping people navigate through stop, stopping, allowing it to control their life or just watching it in general. And Something that I continue to go back on is, man, if you don't change what you're doing, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Yeah. And me, like from a health and fitness professional for a long time, as there's a lot of correlations between health and fitness and spiritual disciplines. And if you want a six pack and if you want a healthy relationship with God, it's going to require the same thing, obedience and discipline. Yeah. That's why I said there's a reason that Jesus called his followers disciples. Yeah. He could have called them anything. He said disciples. It's the root word of the word discipline. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was so freeing to know that like my life, it's not about me. That should take a lot of pressure off. Yeah. You know, it's, man, I got to do this. I got to accomplish this. I got to do this. If I don't do this, this will happen. And this and this and this and this. And it's like, man. Your life was created to give God glory and worship him. And he's already given you a plan and it's perfect. It's awesome. all, all you got to do is pursue it. And then, but you can't respond to God and do what he's calling you to do. If you don't quiet the voice in your own head. So it, like God doesn't, sh God doesn't shout, he whispers. So it's like, he wants to lead you in a certain direction but he wants to be able to speak to you. And he can't do that if, if life, if society, if yourself is the loudest voice in your head. So what do you, how do you encourage people to do that? Just quiet time in the mornings or what are you calling? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's another thing that's, that's really important is, man, you should read the ESV study Bible at 7 a.m. every day. And it's, if you take a legalistic approach to yeah. how you should create a relationship with God, like your relationship with God and my relationship with God is not going to be the same because you are you know, a specific person. Like you are, you have intrinsic value. You are, you are you and you're not me, but God wants to have 
a personal relationship with you. He wants you to have an independent dependency on him and your personality, how you're wired. Like people get so caught up and it's like, man, you gotta have, you, you gotta have this guy all the time. You know, it's like you got, man, God, like technology and what like you version, for example, has done. It's not a coincidence. Like God is the catalyst for everything that is yeah. good. Yeah. So God has pr provided us with tools to know ourselves and to have access to provision. So man, if you learn better, if you are like an audible, like learner, great, listen to it. If you want to read it on your phone instead of a hardback, do that. Right. If you want to get a highlighter and get in there and go nuts, do that. If you want to do it at night or in the morning, like at the end of the day, consistency is what matters again like health and fitness like, man what josh what kind of uh gym should i go to what kind of like workout right. methodology should i follow you should follow the one that you will that you enjoy and that you will do consistently because right. consistency trumps everything so you should worship god in a way that speaks to you and that you will do consistently because over time consistently seeking god and consistently spending time with him that is going to lead to life change. So good, man. All right, lightning round. Let me ask you a couple of questions and then we're going to play this or that. Okay. Uh, all right. What's your favorite verse of the Bible? You probably had several, but just give me the first one that comes to mind. John 6, 33. And that's the, in this world, you'll have trouble or which one was it? Like I've told you these things so that you can have peace. And in this world, you will face trials. Take heart of it. But you can take heart because I've overcome the world. And I love that phrase, take heart. So in, in the Greek, it means a word that means courage. So courage is something that is accessible to you. It's not something you either have or you don't. So it's not like I'm a courageous guy or you're not. Courage, um, courage is found in a person. That person is Jesus and he has an infinite supply. Love it. Okay. What are you listening to or what's your favorite song on the radio right now? Uh, man, I... I listen to like just old, like older, like marshmallow. Like I love like EDM music. So I'm just like a marshmallow nerd and just whatever comes on. I love Maverick City, like promises is fire. So just, so I, I listen to a mix of that. So it's like from a, like a secular standpoint, I listen to a ton of EDM music. My favorite song of all time is Five Minutes by uh, Duero. And I, I, I like the one with Chris Brown, but not as much as just the OG one. I don't even think it has words to it, but that's like that for me, like that's what I normally listen to. Uh, what about you? What are you reading right now? I'm reading two books. I'm reading, gosh, what is it? It's on my phone. Oh, it's a David Platt book. And someone told me that I had to Not read radical. it. Radical? Not radical. So it's about him. He's in the Himalayas and he's going through. Is I'm, I'm really early into it. So I'm reading that. I'm reading Knowing God by J.D. Packer. But yeah, so gosh, what's the name of that? It's not driving you crazy, David Platt. Is it something needs to change? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I see good. it. Awesome. So good. It will absolutely wreck you. Like, I, like radical. I like to read once a year because it just like, it was, yeah, yeah. Like, don't you, don't you think too much of yourself? You know? Yeah. That's a gut check, man. It's damn. Yeah. All right. Also what I thought that was incredible. And I think everyone that communicates in any capacity should read it. The secrets of dynamic communication by Ken Davis, I think is something that anyone that communicates on any spectrum should read. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And it provides clear, it's what the Bible is about, but it's what the book is about, but it's also like really great takeaway as far as like, what are actionable steps that I can take after reading this book? Because I love, it's great to be inspired. It's great to be yeah. motivated. But I mean, this book, okay, you've equipped me to do something. And now I have the tools to make whatever I do better. Nice. What's the future hold for you? Where do you see yourself going? You just building the church? Do you want to travel? What do you want to do? Uh, yeah, man, I want to change the world, man. A, a big vision of mine is within the next 10 years, I want to completely eradicate the production of pornography. I'm planning a church. So Easter will be the first time that we meet at a physical location consistently. So that's exciting. I'm working with some people. We are developing like a systematic process, like what is porn? How did I get here? Repentance, eliminating triggers, accountability, and having a vision for your life. So like 
there, I'm working with a group of people. So we're actually, I'll be in San Diego for about a week and three or four weeks. And we're going to film that curriculum and all of that's going to be like, we're just, we're blazing all that stuff. And it's going to come out in uh, November because the whole like no fat November thing. Yeah. Um, I've done that. Like, and like anyone that has like any kind of like an anti porn or advocacy, like anyone that's advocating against pornography, man, you, there's just an astronomical spike of like people who are willing to interact with content. So a book and that curriculum. And, and so the plan is to do like pretty much right away, go on a speaking tour that coincides with that book. And I'm, co I'm co-writing a book with someone else. I can't pull the trigger on what it is yet, but I, I've co I've, I'm co-wrote a book with someone else and there's, there'll be a speaking tour with that as well. But yeah. I'm on the, I'll be on the 700 club next week. Yeah. So we're doing a round, not next week, next month, we're doing a round table conversation with me and a few other people. And then they are coming out here and doing a, a story on me. And then I'll be on one, 100 Huntley. So that's a, it's a show similar to the 700 club. That's it's in Ontario, Canada. Nice. But yeah, those are like some of the, the big rocks, but I've been working on a book that I wrote for a year. It's called product prodigal porn star is the name of the book. And it's my story. It's gritty. And I've had several people tell me that I shouldn't tell my story in that way. But I think through vulnerability and being transparent, it's yeah. going to because if I don't tell my story the way it is, because like when I first started sharing my story, I, it was hard for me to, for some reason, like I had no issue talking about like my success in the industry. But then the second they were like, man, wow, like you got to the point where like you were doing gay porn, you weren't gay. Like what, what, is, how did that happen? I was just so uncomfortable, but it's, and just God has done so much through, man, just me just being completely honest. Talk about it, dude. Because it's a hard thing to navigate through because I like that is probably the thing that, that people get the most angry with me about. It's all, were you, were you bisexual? Are you still bisexual? It's like, no, I was a prostitute and I sold myself and I saw 300 grand that I was going to make in con in whether I do 30 movies or three, I'm not necessarily attracted to everyone I work with, like on the straight side. So it's like, it, for me, it's, I don't care. It keeps me from killing myself, then great. Yeah. feel like that's where I was sure. and it's like really hard for people to hear because man like same sex attraction is real but it's not something that I've ever personally experienced right. for me like I saw myself as a product to be sold and my product was sex and I had a high value there so it it made sense to me yeah. it was a business transaction and that's just really hard for people to swallow and I'm still like working on how to like really take that part of my story and really reach people who are struggling with same-sex attraction and struggling with, yes, I feel this way, but I'm, you know, wrestling with what does this look like for me to follow God and be a Christian and still feel this way. I really want to, I really want to reach people and um, just tell that story with, with authenticity, because I think that, that yeah. really, what got my life. Yeah. People are so hungry for the transparency now. They don't want the sugar, like the the typical church BS, you know, something that Thomas Nelson's probably going to, or Zondervan's going to sign you to a publishing deal because they're going to want you to write a certain way. I got a few cuss words in my book, but I'm like, this is how I talk. And I'm not going to not tell it the way it really happened. And people respect that so much because they're just tired of the like sugarcoating things and trying to yeah. people yeah. Just, just take off the mask and tell me how it is. Yeah. Because people want to categorize everything. People want to compare everything. And the reality is, man, the reason that Jesus was killed because he didn't fit in the Pharisees box. hundred percent. And I, I want to live my life that I want to live a life that replicates who he is. Yeah. And I feel like I'm really passionate about stewardship. And most people think the finances, but for me, it's, I'm given this story. I'm given this life and I could be dead, yeah. but instead I'm preaching the gospel. Yeah. I have a family. I have three children. I, I've been married for five years mm -hmm. last week you know, we celebrated five years. We, our third son will be born, you know, on the, the 24th of next month is when he's due. It's just, I don't deserve that. And I think that I have a responsibility with what God has done in my life. And I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. And I think through me being bold and transparent and not being afraid of being rejected by 
someone because they didn't like the way I said something. I think if I would say it's from a systematic standpoint, like understanding how to execute ministry at a high level to reach a lot of people by utilizing system. That's something that I, I learned at Life Church. But really believing one thing that they say often, I will do anything short of sin to reach people that don't know Jesus right. and to reach people that no one is reaching. You have to do things that no one is doing. I'm going to, I'm going to get on TikTok and I'm going to utilize the secular music that are, that is trending and yeah. do tr because you know why? Because I understand strategy and social media marketing and yeah, I have a product that I want to sell you and it's the person of Jesus Christ and he, you can't buy him, but man, he wants you and he's pursuing you. And I want you to experience the freedom that I want that for you because yeah. I, yeah. and yet I'm willing to do things that people are going to, oh, you, you shouldn't use that type of music. You shouldn't share your story so often. You can't talk about that. You're a pastor. How are you a pastor? I get that a lot. It's like, man, don't you know that Paul, who wrote a predominant part of the New Testament, used to drag Christians out of their homes and have them killed? Yeah. I haven't killed one person. Not yet. But you keep yeah. talking. You might be the first. No. Yeah. yeah. Really quick, lightning round. Here we go. This or that. Tea or coffee? Coffee. All right. Texting or calling? Texting. Logic or emotion? Logic. Freedom or hope? Hope. Pause time or rewind time? Pause. Okay. Talking or listening? Listening. Ketchup or mayo? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Ketchup. I uh, sorry. I love ketchup. I hate mayonnaise. With a <laughs> all right, man. That's it, dude. Thank wow. you so much for coming on, man. Wow. Like heaven or hell for me. Like <laughs> serious. Like someone threw a, a mayonnaise packet at me when I was a kid, and it landed on my shoe, and it was open, and I puked. That's how much I hate mayonnaise. Oh man, that would be a tough one for me. I love ketchup and mayo. Usually the guy. Yeah, I have kids now, so it's like I've been puked on and pooped on. It's now I don't really care that much anymore. I just don't. I don't care for mayonnaise, but. Yeah. Well, it was great meeting you, Josh. Yeah, dude, absolutely, man. Great talking to you. Appreciate you coming on. All right, brother.